Hello YouTube, this is Fruno. Let's talk about netherboard farms, which is a bit of a niche issue because for brewing you just don't need a ton of them. You will just need a field with a bit of soul sand and a few plants. But if you look at my builds, I absolutely love red nether bricks. I use a ton of red nether bricks in my builds. I think they go with a lot of color palettes. I do need a lot of red nether bricks. And red nether bricks can be crafted from nether wards and nether bricks. And of course, the nether bricks are not an issue. Of course, you can smelt nether rack, and also you get it from pigment buttering, so there's no shortage of that. But you need a ton of nether wards, two nether wards per block. And the problem with nether wards is they grow rather slowly. On average, they take about 35 minutes to grow. And the even worse news is that you can't bone meal them, so there's no way to speed up the growth. So the only thing you can do is to plant a rather large field and harvest them. Now you get a lot more if you use a fortune hoe to harvest the nether wards. Still, if you need a few shulker boxes, it's quite a grind to get these. So I certainly wanted the farm, especially since I suggested a nether tunnel design that included red nether bricks, so we need quite a lot of them. So I created two different farms, and both have their advantages and disadvantages. Now this one is very easy to build, there's no complicated redstone in there, but it needs a bit more space. And this farm is more compact, and of course it's a variant of Il Mango's netherwood farm that he did in the Peaceful series. So in today's video we'll be covering this farm, and I will cover the other farm in a later video. And the top part of this farm is just taken from Il Mango's version. The rates of this farm are pretty good, over 8000 items per hour, or just under hopper speed. That's quite fast for a netherwood farm. The player sits on a four-way flying machine, and the four-way flying machine moves a minecart, and the player sits in the minecart, and uses fast right click or periodic right click at a fast interval to plant the nether wards. The head of the player is in a honey block, but the player doesn't suffocate, and in the two ticks where the flying machine moves, the player is able to plant the blocks. And here at the end, we just move the flying machine one row further, and the flying machine goes back. And what's different from Il Mango's version is that I use more hopper minecarts to collect the nether wards. Il Mango just uses hopper under every salt sand, and this farm here would require about two shulker boxes of hoppers that are of course not locked. And I wanted to build this farm close to my industrial district, so a ton of unlocked hopper was out of the question because of lag. What I did was to use a few flying machines that will be started near the row where the player was planting and harvesting, and the hopper minecarts here will pick up all of the nether wards. And then we just have a timer, which is an ether hopper clock that starts the player again, and we can also do it manually, and this will move the flying machine one row further, and the cycle repeats. Unfortunately, we do need a client-side mod like Trickaroo for fast auto-click. This goes for all large-scale netherboard farms I know, but you can build this farm on a vanilla server because it's a client-side auto-clicker. Adapting this far took much longer than I'd care to admit, because I ran into so many little issues and I had to redesign parts like a dozen times. It's not too hard to build if you follow the schematic, and I believe it took me just two hours to knock out this farm in survival once I had designed it in creative. I'm using a bit different wiring than Il Mango, and to be honest, Il Mango's is probably better, so do look it up in this peaceful series, I'll give a link in the description. But let me show you how such a four-way flying machine works. The flying machine was also designed by Il Mango. We have four pistons, moving the flying machine in the four directions, and we have four observer, each powering one piston. And now if we update, for example, this observer here, it will start this piston, so the flying machine would go in this direction. But once it hits a wall, unmovable blocks, it will break in one direction. If we go here, it will go in this direction. Now this depends on the way how you build the flying machine, but otherwise it's not directional. So in this case, it hit this wall and it tried to go in this way, but there was more obsidian, so it just got stuck in a corner. But if we start the flying machine again in this direction, then we need to find the observer that updates the correct piston, like so. Then it will go in this direction and break in this direction. And unfortunately, this natural movement will always be in opposite direction at opposite side. So if it breaks this way, on one side it will break the other way on the other side. 
And for this farm, we need to shift the flying machine by one block after every lane. Let's go to a smaller version. Now let's say we want to move the flying machine from right to left in this picture. So there's one side where the flying machine will automatically go in the correct direction. So all what we need is some immovable blocks. And then we will stop the flying machine using an extended piston because an extended piston is also not movable. So let's have a look. And as soon as the flying machine arrives, it will go one block further because we don't stop it here. And then we just have a bit of wiring to update the correct observer or the correct piston, which would be that one. And the flying machine goes in this direction. But on the other side, we are out of luck. The flying machine tries to go in the wrong direction, which is this way. So we need two pistons. One is here holding the flying machine in place so it can't go in this direction. And the other piston is here. And what we do is we update this piston here and send the flying machine towards this piston. Then it will hit this piston here and go back over there. And then we need just a bit of wiring that the extended pistons are shifted because obviously once the flying machine has returned here, we need to activate this piston. And this is done by moving any item down a dropper chain where we alternate droppers and hoppers. Now this makes sure that once we pulse this redstone line with a short pulse, the item will travel exactly one dropper. Now it's here, it will go into this dropper if we activate the redstone line and then the hopper will push it into this dropper. If we had only droppers, it would depend on redstone update order. So this is a very simple principle. What we do here, we have an observer sending a pulse and the pulse goes into one of these repeaters. And the repeater both activates the redstone line and also pushes out the correct observer that will start the flying machine again. Here we have sticky pistons pushing observers and this observer will end right up here and power this piston. So let's have a look, maybe a bit slower. So right now nothing happens. The flying machine goes one block to the side, activates the repeater, the repeater pulses the redstone and the flying machine starts out again. On the other side, we could use a similar system, but here I just use a clock to activate the flying machines for a reason that I'll explain in a moment. At the bottom of the setup is the collection system. We can't use any rails down there. The player sits in a minecart and if we would use any rails, for example, using hopper minecarts on rails, the minecart with the player would glitch down and suffocate. So that's not an option. I thought about using a boat because a hopper minecart based collection system is really the easiest thing you can do. But with the boat, I had the issue that the flying machine would sometimes lose the boat. This didn't work. And the idea I settled on was using flying machines. So these collection flying machines are three wide tileable and the engine is a self-returning flying machine, again from El Mango. So this setup is set a six wide tileable. And what happens is that the flying machine with the player will arrive here. The player will return and after a moment, we will activate the flying machines in the vicinity of the player. So they will push the minecart under the salt sand and will pick up any nether wards that lie here. And since this is a self-returning flying machine, the return station is very simple. Basically, we need unmovable block for each of these collection flying machines, but I found it easier just to use a row. So they return on their own. And once they're back, we have more minecarts sitting on hoppers and crucially on top of moss carpets. Moss carpets do not stick to slime, so the moss carpets will not be moved by the flying machines, but they elevate the minecart just a little bit. So these minecarts are just high enough to suck the nether wards out of these minecarts and then they go into hoppers and are put into a water stream. Now the idea of using moss carpets is thanks to Llama with a rifle on Reddit who pointed this out to me because I was pretty much stuck at this point. I tried normal carpets, I tried snow, I tried a lot of things because if we don't have these moss carpets, the minecart will not reach. And if you worry about lag, in this farm I think we have 84 minecarts but we are saving 4,000 hoppers. So I'm not proud of that, but it's at least better than just spamming hoppers here below. 
So on this side where the minecarts naturally turns into the correct side, we just have this very simple return station that pushes out the observer and then we get a redstone pulse here and we subtract a little bit. And so if, for example, if the minecart would come in here, it would at least start these two flying machines. On top we have frog lights. Of course you could use any lighting blocks because I don't want mobs to spawn here. You don't have to use frog lights. I just like them a lot because they give light. They are solid blocks and they are not spawnable, which is quite a nice combination. And on the other side, again, we have just two sets of pistons and both pistons are controlled again by such a hopper dropper line moving the item one block further. And on the return side, basically this dropper will put the item into this dropper here. And then we will notice that this redstone here changes state. So an observer line will transport this so we don't need any hoppers here. And the same setup at the bottom. So let's talk about timing and farm size. Another world takes on average 34 minutes to grow. And I haven't done the precise math, but harvesting after 40 to 45 minutes works pretty well to have most nether warts fully grown. The flying machine goes two rows once it's activated. And here we have 42 rows. And we want the minecart to complete a full cycle after 45 minutes. So take 45 minutes, divide it by 21, because there are 42 rows and the minecart travels two in one go. So that means we need a clock that pulses once every two minutes or just a bit more. If you'd have 20 rows and not 42, then you'd start it once every 4.5 minutes. And this is about 100 blocks. So the flying machine uses about 60 seconds to go one lane or 120 seconds back and forth. And we do need a bit of reserve because once the flying machine arrives at this side, it will just hit this obsidian block, go this way and go back into the parking position here. So I use just a bit under three stacks. The etho clock here takes about 0.8 seconds per item, so this works out nicely. Just test it out once for the long way for the last row, where the minecart has to return to the zero position. And with 21 rows, we harvest once every 49 minutes, which is quite nice. This also means this setup is pretty much at capacity. We can't add any more rows because simply the flying machine is not fast enough to harvest. And I started out with a length of 128 blocks. The idea is let's have a look at the random tick range. So with 100 blocks we have a bit of reserve here so we could make this farm a bit larger. And still if the player sits there all of the farm would be random ticked. But unfortunately at 128 blocks some of these minecarts will be full. Even if they might pick up the nether wards in the next go, the time interval for me is too close to the despawn range. So I just went with 100 blocks, which means the minecarts can pick up all of the items. Of course, the longer the lanes, the less work we have with the return station. We could make the farm a bit larger and or harvest more by eliminating the 25 seconds for the buffer that we need for the minecart to go from there to there. So you could probably increase the rates by about 15% perhaps. So let's have a look what happens at the last row. And the thing of course is that for the last row the player won't pick up nether wards. However, the nether wards from the first pass, which is the last lane where we do have nether wards, will still end up here, laying in the path. And basically the player arrives here, returns and the flying machines are started just a moment later. So the flying machines are a block or two behind the player. And that means that these nether wards are still here once the player arrives. So the player will pick up these nether wards and they replenish the inventory for planting this last row. So unlike El Mongo, we had to create an artificial nether ward supply so the player could pick up some additional nether wards on the way back. We don't need that. It's just done by starting the collection on the other side and starting it just a second later. And here's what happens on the return. The flying machine will just hit this block and of course go in this direction. And then it will just hit these immovable blocks and go in this direction. And wherever I use crying obsidian here, you can of course use any immovable blocks like furnaces or droppers. 
Now for the pitfalls, if you try to adapt this form to your needs, now obviously you have to avoid quasi-connectivity here and the timing has to be just right. But also one issue is one thing that you can see if I enable the hitbox, that while the player is pushed, the player starts basically in the honey block and while the player is pushed forward, the player starts to go forward and now the player is in front of the honey block. So right now we have a setup where this iron bar here, you could also use an end rod that pushes the honey block and also harvests the nether wards, will be behind the player. And that means if the flying machine was to turn, it would lose the player. So what we do is that basically at the end of each lane, we have a solid block and the minecart will be pushed into this position here. And then the end rod is once again in the player and then we do it again here because the player will be pushed into this block here. And this is the reason why we put another block in the place and the minecart here just stops because this part of the flying machine is at the push limit. So if it hits one more block, it will stop. So for the item collection, the farm as a whole gives under 9000 items per hour. So that's within hopper speed. You just need one shulker box loader that works at hopper speed to collect all of the items. But of course the items come a bit in batches because once the flying machine returns, several of the minecarts will have nether wards and we put in the nether wards at, I don't know, four times hopper speed or something like that. So before the system goes to the storage, I just use a very simple buffer. The items are collected in this hopper uh, and this hopper, even if it would be full, it would be just fast enough to pick up all of the items before they despawn. And then I just put the items into a dropper and use a hopper speed clock. So this is of course the oldest clock in the world. And this clock works exactly at hopper speed. So the items will go into this water stream at hopper speed. And here you could have a shulker box loader or a chest where the items go. Of course, a hopper pointing into wool is a tool of the carpet mod that allows me to count the items. Whenever you see a hopper pointing into wool in my world download, that's where your storage goes. In my survival world, obviously I chose to build this farm. Now, is this farm better than the other one? I don't know. It's certainly more compact, but these four-way flying machines are a bit tough to control. But on the other hand, I managed to, to get it working. I ran it for dozens of hours in my single-player world. I built it in my survival server. It works without any issues. So I'm quite happy with the system. But I would certainly recommend you to build the system only if you have some basic knowledge about flying machines because it can be rather frustrating if this flying machine suddenly goes out of control and destroys part of your farm. So as I said, I'm very happy with this farm. Here the items go into my new storage system. And you can see that it will take a while until I run out of red nether bricks. And I'm quite happy with the setup. And I will cover the other nether board farm that is easier to build very soon. Thanks for watching. Leave a like if you want to see more content like this and subscribe so that you don't miss any of my videos. See you next time. Bye bye.